Hey everyone, today we're taking a look at the Microsoft Surface Pro 8. This is the most outstanding update to the mainline Surface Pro product line that we've ever seen in years. Everything from the design to the port selection, everything from base performance to perceived speed, and just almost everything from hardware to software is full of good surprises and appreciable design elements at least in comparison to Surface Pros of the past. A lot of this, what we're seeing here today, is what we, Surface fans, myself included, have been asking for. There are just a few things that I wish Microsoft had done differently, things that would have absolutely made this device perfect for everyone, no questions asked. And I want to begin this review by talking about those things, starting with the processor. Microsoft was so close to giving us what would have been the most future-proof Surface Pro that we've ever seen, or at least as close to being quote-unquote future-proof as the Surface Pro could have ever been. Perhaps compelling would have been a better word to use than future-proof, but regardless of how you word it, they just barely missed their mark because of this one category. So for those who aren't quite up to date with what's happening with CPUs and stuff lately, we're currently on the 12th generation of Intel CPUs, Alder Lake, which debuted back in late October of 2021. And this generation of Intel processors kicked AMD's ass when they came out. The thermals are still pretty questionable, as per typical Intel fashion, but it's definitely nowhere near as bad as previous generation Intel CPUs have been. Although on a much more important note, the performance we saw in literally all of these new 12th gen Intel CPUs were just out of this world. Right when we thought AMD was going to take Intel's crown for making some of the most performant chips we've ever seen, Intel came out of nowhere and was like, nope, check this out, and dropped the most powerful lineup of their streamlined consumer CPUs that we have ever seen. Even the new 12th gen Intel Core i3s, most notably the mobile Intel Core i3s used in laptops, which for years have unfortunately been notorious for generally being a garbage low-end CPU, proved itself to be a much more viable option now for audiences beyond just computer buyers on a budget. It's not an exaggeration to say that we haven't seen a generational performance bump this big with Intel since the transition from their 7th gen to 8th gen CPUs, and even so, that performance bump from the 7th to 8th gen CPUs was nowhere near as huge of an improvement as the generation we now have today. This generation really shook up the market for Windows PCs. What a time to be alive. But, and I think you already know where I'm going with this, we did not get any of those amazing 12th generation Intel CPUs with the Surface Pro 8. Instead, we got some last generation, 11th gen Intel CPUs. Now, on the brighter side of things, most of the 11th gen Intel CPUs that the Surface Pro 8 can be configured with right now still bring a lot of new and appreciable things to the table. Things that Surface Pros have never been able to do until now. Just as some quick examples, you can now edit videos on the Surface Pro 8 somewhat comfortably. And I'm not just talking about 8-bit, low frame rate compressed video files, I'm talking about video projects that contain high resolution HFR 10-bit compressed video files and even moderately large RAW video formats like Blackmagic RAW. You can also do 3D modeling and other 3D creative work much more comfortably now with programs like Blender and the Substance Suite. And get ready for this one guys, you can now play games on the Surface Pro 8 with decent frame rates and decent graphics settings too, not just with everything turned all the way down to low graphics. And I really mean it. Like, I'm not just talking about games like Minecraft or League of Legends or MapleStory, okay? Those are games that can be played on literally any machine. I'm talking about games like Apex Legends, Valorant, Overwatch, God of War, and Elden Ring. Even if you get the entry-level configuration with the Intel Core i5, 1145G7, these graphically intensive games will be 100% playable at decent frame rates and decent graphic settings with the integrated graphics on the Surface Pro 8. That is something we've never been able to say about any other Surface Pro, period. You could have tried it, but it wouldn't have been very fun. Today, that's no longer the case, and I wish more reviewers would talk about this unbelievably massive difference in performance between the Surface Pro 8 and its predecessors. I never thought that I would be able to see games running decently on a Microsoft Surface Pro, 
You guys have no idea how genuinely shocked I was to see it happen. If you thought the Surface Pro 7 Plus had good performance, you really don't know what you're missing out on with the Pro 8. But as a sort of a bittersweet admonition, you do have to remember that this is all just in contrast to previous Surface Pro generations. So sure, you can edit videos, play games, and do a lot more things in general now with the Surface Pro 8. Things that you've never been able to do, at least not comfortably, on a Surface Pro 3 or 4 or 5 or even your 6 or 7 or 7 Plus if you have one. But that's not the Surface Pro 8's only competition. There's other Windows laptops out there. Laptops, and now tablets actually, that can do just as much if not more, in a plethora of other shapes, sizes, and price points. Once you start looking into laptops with these new 12th gen Intel chips, that's where you start to realize, dang, the Surface Pro 8 could have been so much more. And we haven't even started talking about AMD laptops or the M1 and M2 MacBooks yet. Like, if you were to compare the highest tier Surface Pro 8 to, for example, a similarly specced Asus ROG Flow Z13, or literally any other Windows laptop or tablet in its performance class that has a 12th gen Intel processor, this thing's gonna look like garbage compared to that. Don't forget, you literally just heard all of the positive things that I just said about the Surface Pro 8 and the last gen Intel CPUs that power it. So for me to immediately call the Surface Pro 8 quote unquote garbage next to its competition with the 12th gen Intel CPUs and everything is saying quite a lot about how big of a performance difference these two generations actually have, as well as how big of a missed opportunity this was for Microsoft and the Surface Pro 8. And I totally get it. Some of you guys might be watching this looking at me funny all like, really? Could the Surface Pro 8 have been that much better? Like, yeah, man, I'm telling you guys, this is a much bigger deal than a lot of you might think it is. I don't mean to get super sweaty about this stuff, but when you're talking about a one to $3,000 computer that advertises itself as the biggest generational overhaul that its entire family has ever received, you kind of have to. If you get the Surface Pro 8 with an Intel Core i5, the specific CPU you'd be getting is an i5-1145G7. And if you get it with an Intel Core i7, it'll be an i7-1185G7. Both are quad-core processors with a decent clock speed and Intel Iris XE graphics. Hopefully I said that right. There is an i3 configuration you could get, which is the dual-core processor with Intel UHD graphics instead of Intel Iris XE graphics, but you won't see that on the consumer product page. You'll have to look up the Surface Pro 8 for business product page to see that configuration. Although right now, it is the same price as the entry-level configuration found in the regular consumer product page, so I really hope you guys don't actually consider getting that i3 configuration. I'd feel really bad for you if you did. If you're looking at the first two entry-level configurations and are wondering what the differences are between the regular i5 and the Evo i5 configurations, it's literally nothing, as far as you should be concerned. Regardless of what Surface Pro 8 configuration with an i5 you get, you're going to get an i5-1145G7, whether it's advertised as Intel Evo or not. And in terms of any major CPU performance differences between the regular i5 and the Intel Evo branded i5, again, there's nothing different as far as you should be concerned. For those who really want to know anyway, the actual difference is that, well, actually it's not really a difference, so to speak, but anyway, Intel Evo branding requires a solid state drive with a minimum size of 256 gigabytes. In other words, it's just the storage requirement that's different. It's not even directly related to real world CPU performance or anything like that. So seriously, don't worry about whether or not the i5 configuration you like is Intel Evo branded or not. It literally does not matter as far as most people should be concerned. Okay, now the second thing that I wish Microsoft had done differently with the Surface Pro 8 involves the port placements. Not the port selection, but rather the placements of the ports themselves. So on the Surface Pro 8, we have a very similar selection of ports to that of what we have on the Surface Pro X, except this time the USB-C ports both support Thunderbolt 4, and we now have a 3.5mm audio jack that supports both audio in and audio out. All good stuff so far. But what I don't understand is why Microsoft went out of their way to make the placements of literally every single port different from the Surface Pro X. With the exception of the Surface Type Cover port, 
of course, but it's still extremely interesting to me that they moved everything else. The port placements for this sort of a minimal selection of ports were perfect on the Surface Pro X. So prior to the Surface Pro 8's debut, I was hoping that these placements would carry over to the Intel-based Surface Pros if they started adopting the Surface Pro X's design and port selection, but now we can clearly see that this didn't happen. Now, the reason why the port placements on the Surface Pro X were a lot better to me was mainly because you get ports on both sides of the device, which made these ports much more accessible for a wider range of desk setups and office setups with fixed cables. Albeit, they weren't the same ports on both sides, but since they were all capable of charging the device, video out, data transfers, and more, I found this minor discrepancy to be completely forgivable, and I think most people would agree with me. On another note, if the Surface Pro 8 had the same port placements as the Surface Pro X, a lot of port expansion accessories and docking stations that are dependent on the physical design of both products would have been compatible with both models. But because of these differing port placements, many Surface Pro X compatible accessories may not be compatible with the Surface Pro 8, and vice versa. I have a feeling that Microsoft set up the port placements this way so that they would feel similar to the placements found on the Surface Pro 4 through 7 Plus, but I don't really see how that helps anyone because even if Microsoft was trying to demonstrate strong considerations for the port placements' generational consistency, the ports themselves are all completely different anyway, and on top of that, the Surface Pro 8's actual device dimensions are extremely different from its predecessor, so nobody is going to benefit from this, and it doesn't seem like Microsoft has thought about this too well. The Surface Connect port is also still way too low. I feel like I say this every time I talk about the Surface Pro with people, and I wish Microsoft would just bring it up a bit already. Right now, if you plug something into that port and the cable feeds straight downward, it's going to bend a ton, which is really bad for your cable. I love the Surface Connect port's placement on the Surface Pro X and would vouch every day of the year for Microsoft's designers and engineers to bring it back, but even if they don't bring it back and try to keep it near the bottom right corner of the device, that's totally fine as long as they don't continue placing this port too close to the actual bottom of the device. Again, just bring it up a bit so that people's cables aren't bending too hard. It shouldn't be that difficult of a change, Microsoft. Seriously. Now, for some of you, the port placements might be way less of a concern since the positive end of this trade-off with the ports in general is that we now have Thunderbolt ports this generation, which is something we've never had until now that everyone's been asking for years. But I am very passionate about streamlining these placements because I know that making the port placements the same as how they are on the Surface Pro X will make the Surface Pros a much better product line. Maybe not so much for the end user since, you know, most people aren't going to buy a Surface Pro 8 and a Surface Pro X. That's kind of weird. But for everyone else, accessory makers, case makers, businesses, etc., having streamlined port placements would be very nice. With everything I've said regarding the Surface Pro 8's ports, Microsoft only has one more generation, max, to streamline their port placements. Meaning if the next Surface Pro is going to be a Surface Pro 8 Plus or a Surface Pro 9, then they need to streamline the port placements there, starting with that generation. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. And the way they should do it is by, again, making the port placements exactly the same as how it is on the Surface Pro X. These ports don't all need to be all on the right side. And if Microsoft insists on continuing with this trend, they better give us more ports or make better use of all that free space. All right, the third thing, and I guess the final major thing that I wish was different about the Surface Pro 8 has to do with the keyboard. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with it, Surface Pro keyboards have always been very solid keyboards that are exceptionally nice looking, but I just wish that these keyboards, or keyboard covers, I should say, had one feature, and that would be the ability to use the keyboard and trackpad while the cover is detached. That would be an absolute game changer for me both at work and in college, and I'd imagine that would be the same for a lot of other people as well. It would help me a lot during tabletop presentations in school while tabling at events and even while drawing since I heavily rely on keyboard shortcuts more than I rely on hardware buttons and pucks. 
Not only would this heavily elevate the mouse and keyboard experience on the Surface Pro 8, it would also make the price premium for these keyboard covers a little bit more justifiable, in my opinion. Right now, the Surface Pro 8 keyboard is sold separately and sold at a price premium that is arguably ridiculous for what you get on paper. It's essentially a $1 to $300 slim wired keyboard and trackpad, which for a lot of people, I had imagined, is way outside their idea of how much any wired keyboard should cost. Now, you do have the options to customize the keyboard cover with some nice Alcantara material or a fingerprint reader, and you could configure it to come bundled with a Surface Slim Pen 2 and a built-in storage compartment for that pen specifically, but, you know, it's still money I wish I didn't have to spend for something that's been more or less the same for a few years now. To be fair, this computer is intended to be a tablet first and a laptop second, although let's be real, nobody really uses a Surface Pro that way. So this accessory clearly needs something else, new, but useful. And adding some hardware that allows for the keyboard cover to be used when detached would be a little something that I think everyone would appreciate. Again, there's nothing wrong with it. Functionally wrong with it, that is. I just think this would make the Surface Pro 8 keyboard covers a little bit more utile. Now, if you're able to overlook its price premium for a moment, the actual keyboard itself is pretty solid. It's backlit, it has a row of function slash multimedia keys, and the spacing between keys is just right for a keyboard of this size. My hands don't feel cramped whatsoever when I use this keyboard. The area of the individual keys themselves are also very nice. They aren't too big, nor too small, and I'm not at all bothered by the key travel distance. It's pretty much the exact same keyboard as the one found on the Surface Pro X's keyboard covers, including the original versions. So if you saw my review of the Surface Pro X, you already know that this is a pretty great keyboard since it's basically the same thing. The only noticeable difference between the two is that the Windows key now has the Windows 11 logo printed on it. So yeah, Overall, I think it's safe to say that this is a very comfortable keyboard to type on. Everything's excellent, as it's always been. The trackpad is also very nice. It's not a huge trackpad like what you may find on some other laptops, but despite what you may be seeing on camera, this is not by any means a tiny trackpad. I think it's still reasonably sized for most users, and the build quality is excellent. You're getting a glass, multi-touch trackpad that's about 4.5 inches diagonally, and it's really nice to use. The surface texture is very smooth and nice to move your finger through, so performing gestures and engaging in any sort of basic mouse navigation movements will surely be a comfortable experience. Not to mention, it's also taking advantage of Windows precision drivers, so responsiveness to your gestures and other forms of input tracking and software will always be at its best. The physical clicks on the trackpad do sound a bit quieter compared to the earlier variants of the Surface Pro X keyboard. Or maybe not quieter? but less sharp, for the lack of a better term. Take a quick listen to this. They're definitely different. It's slightly more muffled than my Surface Pro X keyboard from 2019, but also a tad quieter. If you ever get the opportunity to handle these keyboard covers in person, you'll definitely be able to hear the differences. Some people don't really like loud trackpads, and I don't think the trackpad on the Surface Pro 8's keyboard is particularly loud, but it does still make a prominent clicking noise. It's definitely not as loud as my Surface Book's trackpad though, that's for sure. So yeah, that's it for the keyboard and trackpad. Overall, this keyboard cover accessory is, well, solid. There's no other way to put it. I've had my Surface Pro 8's Ice Blue Signature keyboard since it released back in October of 2021, and it's really held up over the months, to my surprise. The fabric hasn't torn, the palm rest areas haven't darkened, discolored, or have gotten super dirty, at least not yet, and I get a lot of compliments from my friends about how luxurious this keyboard looks and feels. Dare I say, it still looks like new. Albeit I'm cleaning this like every other week, but I'd like to think that I've been really putting this keyboard cover through its paces and really abusing this thing to keep up with me and my university research. Through all the chaos it's been through, it's been holding up just fine. With a little bit of love and occasional cleaning, I think this thing will surely last a very long time. Something that I've always liked about this keyboard cover design is that when you fold it back with the keys facing outward, 
it doesn't cover the camera, so that makes it really easy to take photos of whiteboards or whatever without having a huge keyboard dangling underneath the device. And then once you're done with that, you can just flip the keyboard back over to instantly get back to whatever you were doing. Now, if you'd like to dock keyboard covers like these backwards for storage purposes or better ergonomic handling or whatever, do keep in mind that the rear facing camera will be blocked if you fold the keyboard cover back with the keys facing inward rather than outward. So you should probably have the keyboard docked normally during active use of the device if you'll be regularly taking photos to annotate or send to your coworkers or something. It's not that big of a deal, but it is something helpful to keep in mind. Alongside the release of the Surface Pro 8 came a brand new Surface Slim Pen as well. It's called the Surface Slim Pen 2. Now, compared to the first generation Surface Slim Pen, the changes introduced with this new pen are quite negligible, if I were completely honest with you. But it carries on the crown that its predecessor has always had for providing the absolute best pen experience that you're going to get on a Microsoft Surface. Albeit, you have to use one of these with a Surface that was built around the Surface Slim Pen experience, which is currently limited to the Surface Pro X, Surface Duo 2, Surface Laptop Studio, and now the Surface Pro 8, of course. But assuming you do, it's going to be a blast. The Surface Slim Pen 2 supports up to 4096 levels of pressure sensitivity and has pen tilt functionality as well. There is a side button and a programmable eraser that can actually be pressed and used as an eraser. Although keep in mind that the eraser end still isn't pressure sensitive, which is kind of a bummer. I'm still looking forward to the day we get that on the Surface Slim Pen. Physical pen input works right out of the box, but to use the buttons, you'll have to pair your Surface Slim Pen 2 to the device and it'll do that over a Bluetooth 5.0 connection. The majority of this product's exterior seems to be made out of plastic rather than metal. If you're coming from an older Surface Pro setup sporting a 2015 or 2017 Surface Pen, then this difference in material will stand out quite a bit. Probably for the worse, but you'll get used to it if you're willing to give it a chance. It also only comes in one color, which is matte black. This could change in the future. We'll see. I kind of doubt it considering how long this product's been running with one color option only. But for now, the only way to give your Surface Pro 8 a hint of color through first party accessories is by buying a colored signature keyboard. The Surface Slim Pen 2 wirelessly charges in this little storage tray at the top of some Surface Pro signature keyboards. It attaches magnetically so you can safely store it without any fears of it falling off somehow. If you'd like, you can also hide that storage tray by pushing the top of the keyboard cover up a little bit against the device. Pretty sleek, if you ask me. And in terms of battery life, all I've got to say is that it's phenomenal. I'll be honest with you, I'm not gonna thoroughly test this part but mainly because the Surface Slim Pen 2 isn't intended to be detached from its storage tray for a really long period of time. I can assure you though that this can easily last more than 24 hours away from its storage tray, so I'd imagine that the battery life will be just fine for whatever you need to do with this pen. You can stay up late drawing with this pen, or go crazy with it while taking notes during a college lecture, and you shouldn't really have a dent in your battery percentage afterwards. That might change as the battery degrades over time, since this is intended to always be stored away and charging as soon as you're done using it, which, as you all should hopefully know, isn't a very good thing to do with lithium-ion batteries in general. But again, I have a Surface Pro X with the original first-generation Surface Slim Pen, and it's still going hard. My first generation Surface Slim Pen, which I've had since October of 2019, can easily last a few days away from its storage tray or charger. So I'd imagine the Surface Slim Pen 2 to hold up just as well. Microsoft made your primary charging option pretty convenient, so you shouldn't really have an excuse not to have a Surface Slim Pen 2 fully charged to 100% every time you pull it out. If you're wondering what the difference is between the Surface Slim Pen 1 and 2, the more noteworthy minor differences simply come down to the pen tip size and the side button's design. The Surface Slim Pen 2's tip is ever so slightly finer than the pen tips included with the original 
first generation Surface Slim pens, and the side button was moved to the flat side of the pen, with a significantly different distance from the tip. I'm not a huge fan of the new side button placement because I find the old side button much more comfortable to use. This new side button placement seems to be intended to be used with your thumb a lot more rather than your index finger, which sucks for me since I usually prefer to use the side button on various styluses using my index finger, but I don't think this will really make or break your experience, so I'm not going to sulk about that too much right now. The biggest difference, however, comes down to haptics. The original Surface Slim Pen didn't have any vibration motors to give off haptic feedback, but this generation, the Surface Slim Pen 2 does, and it's actually a really nice experience for the extremely small list of programs that support this feature. Now, personally, I think this would have been a super attractive feature had it been supported system-wide, but because it's only supported in Office programs as well as a very, very small selection of third-party apps that most people won't really use, it comes off more as a gimmick to me than as a novel addition to the Surface Slim Pen. Fortunately, the note-taking experience continues to be exceptional with the Surface Slim Pen 2, with the most important contributor to this statement being that there is no jitter whatsoever with the Surface Slim Pen 2, or at least no significant amount of human noticeable jitter while drawing or writing on the Surface Pro 8 with this pen. If you ever hear someone say that they've experienced jitter while taking notes or drawing on a Surface Pro 8, Either they aren't using a Surface Slim Pen 2, or they're just talking out of their ass. Excuse me for saying that, but it needs to be said. This is a product that isn't messing around. Admittedly, it is pretty expensive, but like the keyword covers, if you're able to overlook the price premiums for the Surface Slim Pen 2, you will find this on-screen pen experience to be strikingly unparalleled among Windows PCs you will get the best note-taking experience on the Surface Pro 8 with a Surface Slim Pen 2. Maybe even the best note-taking experience you've ever had in your life, depending on what devices you've previously owned. The note-taking experience with the Surface Slim Pen 2 is noticeably accurate, precise, and more importantly, in my opinion, fun. If you're coming from a 2015 or 2017 Surface Pen, Anything you've disliked about the on-screen writing experiences with those products won't be making an appearance here. For example, it is possible to write extremely small with the Surface Slim Pen 2 on the Surface Pro 8, which at first might not sound like a big deal to people just now looking into these products, but this is something that you couldn't have said about any other Surface Pro and Surface Pen combination. The reason being because issues related to intense jitter will immediately get in the way. Again, going back to the lack of jitter issues being the most important contributor to my statement claiming this note-taking experience to be exceptional. The palm rejection on the Surface Pro 8 has been flawless for me personally, although this is an outcome that is completely dependent on your hand size, so some of you guys might have a different experience. I will say that the palm rejection is quite different compared to that of what I experienced on my Surface Pro X, so it's pretty obvious to me at least, that Microsoft put in some effort to improve the palm rejection in some way. Something I did notice, however, is that the Surface Slim Pen 2 lists zero force inking on its spec sheet. For those who haven't been able to figure out what that correlates to, it's basically suggesting that the Surface Slim Pen 2 requires no activation force to draw something on screen, which isn't technically true. You do have to have the pen tip prominently in contact with the display in order to reliably draw anything on screen. And we can much more easily see the truth in that statement by gliding the pen tip across the Surface Pro 8's display while the other end of the pen is resting on my index finger rather than being held by my fingers. As you can see, the Surface Slim Pen 2 isn't continuously drawing something even though the pen tip is clearly making contact with the display, which indicates that it does in fact, require some amount of activation force from the user in order to reliably draw on screen. Compare this to any iPad Pro that supports the second generation Apple Pencil. Doing the same test shows that the second generation Apple Pencil truly does not require any activation force by the user in order to draw on screen. 
This is what quote unquote zero force inking should look like, which the Surface Slim Pen 2 doesn't technically do on the Surface Pro 8. However, I do want to emphasize that the actual activation force needed to draw on screen with the Slim Pen 2 is still extremely close to nothing. It might not be Microsoft's definition of zero force, but it is pretty close to zero. So you really shouldn't let this discrepancy deter you from getting a Surface Slim Pen 2. It's not as big of a problem as you might think. In fact, it's not even a problem at all if I had anything to say about it. I just felt the need to confront this claim because even though the activation force is pretty close to nothing, that doesn't mean it's actually nothing. Enough about that though. At the end of the day, taking notes on the Surface Pro 8 is amazing with the Surface Slim Pen 2. The on-screen writing experience is not just okay or good or even great. It's amazing. It doesn't just get the job done, it gets the job done well. There's no jitter, the pressure sensitivity measurement is pretty high, you have a very convenient way to store away and charge your Surface Slim Pen 2, and the activation force needed to draw, although it's not zero, is pretty close to nothing. Just keep in mind that you can't magnetically attach the Surface Slim Pen 2 to the left-hand side of the Surface Pro 8. That's not supported anymore with this new design, which might be a huge bummer to some people upgrading from older Surface Pros that originally shipped with Windows 10. Don't let the lack of ports on that side fool you. The drawing experience on the Surface Pro 8 with the Surface Slim Pen 2 is just as wonderful as the note-taking experience. If any of you guys remember my full review of the Surface Pro X from a couple of years ago, you might recall that I had a lot of beef with the drawing experience on that device. But the key thing to note there was that it wasn't bad because of the Surface Slim Pen. It was bad because the graphical limitations of ARM severely gimped the drawing experience and only the drawing experience specifically. The general note-taking experience was nowhere near as bad for some reason. Now, I haven't made an updated review for the Surface Pro X yet, but as of this video, the drawing experience on the Surface Pro X has gone a lot better thanks to the introduction of 64-bit emulation on ARM in Windows 11, but it's still a pretty unattractive experience to a degree on OS Build 22000. That will definitely change in version 22H2, but we're not talking about that right now. The reason why I brought up that negative drawing experience from my Surface Pro X review, which as far as you should be concerned is still more or less the same today in Windows 11 OS Build 22000, is to directly contrast that experience to that of what you'll be getting here on the Surface Pro 8. Performance in applications like Clip Studio Paint, Substance Painter and Photoshop is just fine. Everything works as expected. I'm not saying that as a way of reassuring you that grass is green, if you know what I'm trying to say, but rather that the drawing experience you're getting on the Surface Pro 8 is going to be a good one, unlike how it is on its ARM-based sibling of the same design. Don't associate the drawing experience from the Surface Pro X with the Surface Pro 8 is basically what I'm trying to say. I've seen a lot of people on the internet do that simply because both devices have more or less the same physical design, which is an extremely erroneous assumption to make. That's like judging a book by its cover, you know? But anyway, drawing is great. It's a lot more enjoyable on a Surface Pro 8 than any other Surface Pro, and the lack of jitter while drawing with the Slim Pen 2 definitely contributes to this massively more enjoyable drawing experience. I'm not really sure if I'll be able to finish this drawing in time for this video, so I'm gonna just show some b-roll of other drawings that I've worked on with the Surface Pro 8. Now, something that I do wish the Surface Slim Pens had were the pen tips from the 2015 and 2017 Surface Pens, because those pen tips had, like, this rubber pen tip that introduced a very natural amount of friction while writing and drawing, and I really liked that. The Surface Slim Pen 1 and 2 don't have those rubber tips. It's just a fine plastic pen tip that, at first, feels like you're ice skating on top of the display. You know, kind of like how the Apple Pencils have always felt. You could get a textured screen protector to make the pen experience on the Surface Pro 8 closer to that of traditional pencil on paper, but the trade-off to doing that is usually that the quality of the display gets significantly reduced due to the intensity of the screen protector's texture. And on top of that, the plastic pen tips on the Surface Slim Pens will wear out significantly faster on these textured screen protectors or writing films. I use fine plastic tips over glossy displays basically every day, so I'm pretty used to this experience by now. But for those who aren't, getting used to this digital inking setup might be a slightly awkward process. Also, if you have a Surface Dial, 
that won't work on display with the Surface Pro 8. You can only use it off display or in other words, on a table. Speaking of the display, we're getting a crazy upgrade this generation. Larger screen, nicer colors, and now we finally have a high refresh rate display. It's 120Hz and it looks phenomenal. A high refresh rate display is something that I've been wishing for in a Surface Pro, and we finally got it. Unfortunately, the refresh rate is set to 60Hz by default, so you are going to have to set it up and all that stuff before you can even see that 120Hz refresh rate in action. I thought that was kind of weird. I was expecting the refresh rate to be set to 120Hz right out of the box, you know, like literally every other tablet, but it wasn't, and I noticed that immediately. I guess Microsoft has their reasons for it, but I'm just hoping that battery life isn't one of those reasons because as crazy as it sounds to some people, it doesn't really affect battery life all that much, at least not as much as you think it does. This is a feature that I feel like most people may accidentally forget about, so try not to forget to set that refresh rate to 120Hz as soon as you boot into your desktop because if you leave your Surface Pro 8 at 60Hz all the time, then that kind of defeats the purpose of getting a Surface Pro 8 right? That high refresh rate is one of the many big reasons to still consider it, even with some of its other drawbacks in mind. If you're going to be paying for a 120Hz display, you might as well use it. The viewing angles are great, there isn't any brightness shift or color shift or anything of the sort, and the display is able to get pretty bright. Microsoft advertises that it gets as bright as 450 nits, I was able to measure 442 nits, so I feel like that's within a 1% margin of error or something, and I'm totally fine with that. That means this display is about as bright as the Surface Pro X's display, and significantly brighter than any of the previous gen Surface Pros following the traditional numbering scheme. It's still somewhat less than ideal when you're in an environment with some harsh sunlight, but at least now you'll still be able to see what's on your screen to some degree, whereas with previous generations, harsh sunlight could completely block whatever content you're looking at. The cameras are great for what they're intended to be used for. It's the same setup as the Surface Pro X, which is a 5 megapixel front facing camera and a 10 megapixel rear facing camera. They might not have the best dynamic range compared to most smartphones and even some tablets actually, but these are some of the better built in cameras that you can get on a Windows machine. And they're significantly better than MacBook cameras too. Although with continuity camera coming out, that's probably not going to matter to most people. But anyway, great cameras for what they're intended to be used for. Like I said, you're not going to be taking photos of, you know, your life's memories or anything of the sort. This is more for things like a quick snap of someone's whiteboard at work or at a lecture room in college. Or maybe you need a digital copy of a document on your surface for your convenience. You know, stuff like that. And in addition to that, the cameras will make you look great in video calls as well. For the majority of the Surface Pro 8's audience, it'll probably only be used for Zoom meetings, considering the times we're in right now. Personally, I use it for a lot of other things too, like sometimes I have casual video calls with friends on Discord or Skype, and the front-facing webcam makes me look really good, much better than my iPad Pro's camera. There are some times that I want to show my friends something cool that I got for my room, or something like that, and that's where I'd switch to the rear-facing camera, which has a bigger sensor and supports a larger video resolution, up to 4K UHD, rather than just full HD with the front-facing camera. That's something most laptops can't do, and some of you might actually appreciate having both cameras there for situations like that. You do get a stereo pair of 2 watt speakers that sound just fine. It does lack bass, but the lack of bass isn't as bad as the majority of other Windows tablets and laptops that I've gotten my hands on, so these speakers don't really come off as bad or underwhelming to me. I know that might clash with what some other reviewers are saying about the Surface Pro 8's speakers, but that's just how I genuinely feel. These are a pair of very decent, clear sounding speakers that produce a very bright sound. Sure, they lack bass, but it doesn't lack as much bass as you might think it does. I know Windows laptops and tablets don't really have a good reputation when it comes to speakers, but I wouldn't put the Surface Pro 8 anywhere near the same tier as those other devices. These are really small stereo speakers, but they produce some very respectable and well-balanced audio regardless. All right, let's talk about gaming 
on the Surface Pro 8. Assessing gaming performance wasn't hard. In short, the Surface Pro 8 isn't an ideal gaming setup if you're going to be limited to the integrated graphics for the entirety of your time with this machine, but it can play games surprisingly well on integrated graphics, which is completely new for the entire Surface Pro product line. The Surface Pro 7 Plus doesn't even come close to the kind of graphics performance that the Pro 8 is capable of. It's easy to get a stable 60 FPS on most moderately graphics intensive titles at medium graphics settings, but if you really want to take advantage of that high refresh rate, you'll definitely have to turn everything down to low graphics. You do have to keep in mind that this isn't advertised as a gaming laptop or anything like that. This is intended to be more of a work computer, so to speak. So gaming isn't supposed to be a priority whatsoever for the Surface Pro 8, but it's still nice that it's capable of playing a respectable selection of games pretty well. And again, that's just on integrated graphics. We haven't even got to the good stuff yet. I know this isn't a very graphically intensive game, but I've been playing a lot of Valorant lately and it easily hits a stable high frame rate of 120 FPS while using the Surface Pro 8's integrated graphics at medium graphics settings and at a slightly lower screen resolution than native. If I wanted to bump that resolution up to the Surface Pro 8's native screen resolution, that's where it starts to drop quite a number of frames, but it's never gone under 100 FPS. So in that case, you could cap it at 60 FPS or even 90 FPS to maintain a stable and somewhat high frame rate, or you could also just set everything back to low graphics to resecure that stable frame rate at 120 FPS. And for a game like Valorant, it doesn't really suffer from the general disadvantages of low graphics settings too much since its art style is pretty flexible with various combinations of graphics settings. The same can be said for many other games like Okami, Spyro Reignited Trilogy, and Fall Guys. Mostly single player games though. Now, before I got comfortable telling people that gaming on the Surface Pro 8 is quote unquote decent, I had to solve a big problem. It's not a hard problem to solve, but if you're inexperienced with drivers, then looking out for this might not be as straightforward as a lot of tech enthusiasts, including myself, may make it seem. So let me explain. Back when I got my Surface Pro 8, gaming performance was trash. Even games that could run on a potato like Minecraft or MapleStory were disgustingly unplayable. Valorant, which is again one of the less graphically intensive games out there, played at less than one frame per second, even in menus. So I was really close to being like, yep, the Surface Pro 8 still can't play games. But then I was like, wait, something's gotta be wrong. The Surface Pro 7 Plus was at least able to run Minecraft and could at least run Valorant at like 30 FPS back when I had my unit. So why couldn't the Surface Pro 8 do that? Around that time, I also started playing Fortnite again, please don't roast me, and I got the idea to try playing some other games on the Surface Pro 8, with one of those being Fortnite. Turns out, the drivers that I had on my Surface Pro 8 were super old, really buggy, and very unstable for some reason, and Fortnite was actually the reason why I was able to figure this out. So I needed to update my integrated graphics drivers in order to get Fortnite, and well, all of my games in general, to run. Now, ideally, Microsoft wants you to get the drivers for all of your services exclusively from Windows Update, but the problem with that is that the latest integrated graphic drivers from Intel or AMD aren't always going to be available through Windows Update. So I downloaded the Intel Driver and Support Assistant and installed all of the driver updates that were available, including the latest Intel graphics driver for my iGPU, and after that, everything worked perfectly. This isn't a situation where you can just say, well, you should have updated your drivers the moment you booted into your desktop. Because in my case, I did. One of the things that I always do is run Windows Update at some point right after completing the Windows out of box experience, which is also the method that Microsoft asserts that you exclusively take in order to get new drivers for your Surface whenever they come out. But the graphics drivers available in Windows Update aren't always the drivers that we're supposed to be getting, at least according to Intel. And it's still like this today, almost a year after the Surface Pro 8's release. So if you wanna play games on your Surface Pro 8, make sure to update your graphics drivers. And if the graphics drivers that you're getting from Windows Update don't look quite right, get them straight from Intel. Once you do that, frame rates should look more like this on integrated graphics. 
Now the really neat thing about the Surface Pro 8 is that we now have Thunderbolt 4 ports. I already mentioned this earlier in the video, but I'm bringing it back because this can really help boost gaming performance if you have an eGPU or are planning to introduce an eGPU into your Windows ecosystem. I have a Razer Core X with an RTX 2080 Ti, and it really does wonders for the Surface Pro 8. With my eGPU, this is what frame rates look like on high graphics and at the Surface Pro 8's native screen resolution. Do keep in mind though that I am using a Thunderbolt 4 cable rather than a Thunderbolt 3 cable for my setup. And although that may sound like virtually nothing's happening since the Razer Core X is advertised as a Thunderbolt 3 eGPU, not Thunderbolt 4, it actually is helping quite a bit in terms of stability. But anyway, introducing an eGPU to your Surface Pro 8 setup will really elevate the versatility aspect of this machine. And it's not just for the sake of gaming. This can be really beneficial for everything else that relies on graphics, like 3D modeling, video editing, and other digital media activities. Of course, there are other things to consider, like how the bandwidth of Thunderbolt 3 and 4 is a pretty big bottleneck for a setup like this or how using the built-in display impacts performance quite a bit compared to having your video feed sent out to an external monitor connected directly to the GPU in your eGPU, but I feel like the details of these considerations can be discussed elsewhere. Overall, the Surface Pro 8 still largely benefits from the performance improvements introduced from an eGPU. And if you ever feel the need to game away from your eGPU, the integrated graphics should be decent enough for most games in this situation. Thermals aren't garbage, although I'd be lying if I said that thermals were alright. These processors still run pretty hot, again as per typical Intel fashion, but it's evidently not as bad as what the majority of people on the internet have been suggesting it is. I think the best way to put it is that the Surface Pro 8 attempts to handle thermals surprisingly well considering how much room the thermal system has to work in there, but the exterior still gets noticeably warm to the touch, and that physical feeling of a warm device massively overshadows any concerns about the CPU package temps. The aluminum enclosure doesn't get scorching hot or anything, don't get me wrong, but it does get super warm, especially on the i7 configurations. I found that most people I handed my Surface Pro 8s to were extremely surprised at how warm this thing gets, despite CPU package temps not actually being high whatsoever when I go to check those temps amid those reactions. And over time, I started having some of those same impressions as well, eventually getting to the realization that having a warm feeling device seemed to actually be much more jarring of an observation to me than the internal temperatures. This should definitely come off as a good thing, considering how bad thermals have been in the past with Intel CPUs, not to mention I'm still talking about the 11th gen chips, not the 12th gen stuff with better thermals. But with how prominent of a handheld device that this is, it's still important to be considerate of the outer surface temperatures as well. And I quote my friend, wow, this thing gets really warm. Now, although the package temps are capable of reaching 97, 98, 99 degrees Celsius, it realistically shouldn't ever be near that temperature, not even while gaming. Package temps on the Surface Pro 8 should normally be sub 80 degrees Celsius at its worst, and while it's not the best result you could ask for, those internal temperatures are a lot better than that of most tablet PCs in its class. The i7 configurations are usually peaking around the higher end of those sub 80 temperatures, while the i5 configurations are usually in the lower 80s, sometimes even averaging in the mid to high 70s, depending on the environmental conditions of your working environment. The i5 configurations have significantly better thermal performance and actually never thermal throttles as a result of that, even while gaming. However, the trade-off with the Surface Pro 8's i7 configurations is that these higher tier configurations do have a clear and significant increase in performance, which means that although the i7 configurations do suffer from thermal throttling at times, they are all still worth considering because of their significant performance differences alone. Both the i5 and the i7 configurations have fans, so if you're coming from a Surface Pro 6, 7, or 7 Plus, expecting the Surface Pro 8's i5 configuration to be fanless, you might be disappointed to hear that this isn't the case. On the positive side of things, thermal throttling shouldn't occur on the i5 configurations because 
the thermal system is assisted by fan cooling rather than just passive cooling by itself and it actually is extremely effective. But there is a market for fanless computers, so the inclusion of fans on the entry-level configurations might actually turn some heads away. Drive speeds are fairly respectable, but I noticed that they weren't consistent between configurations, especially when it came to write speeds. Unfortunately, there isn't a micro SD card slot anymore, which might be a bummer for those who value expandable storage, but there is a pretty good trade-off to this. The internal storage drive is now user accessible and user upgradable, which is a really big deal. Like the Surface Pro X, there's a small panel underneath the kickstand that can be popped off with a semi-jack tool or a paperclip or something. And behind that is the removable internal SSD. You can't miss it. It's an M.2 2230 NVMe drive. And to remove it, all you have to do is unscrew this tiny screw, and then you can pull out the stock SSD and optionally put in your new one. Super easy. Outside of that process though, I guess the only thing that isn't so easy is finding the right SSD to use for your upgrade because these 2230 M.2 drives aren't that easy to find in my opinion, at least not reliably. I do wish that Microsoft had kept the micro SD card slot in the Surface Pro 8, maybe even with support for UHS-2 micro SD cards instead of just UHS-1, but hey, if I had to choose, I'd gladly take user upgradable internal storage solutions over expandable storage solutions any day. Battery life is decent. It's not hard to find other laptops that outperform the Surface Pro 8 in the battery life department, but it's still pretty good, or at least acceptable. Now, if you recall just a short while ago, I said that the 120Hz refresh rate didn't really affect battery life all that much. And I stand by what I said, albeit with a little hesitation because even I am quite shocked about it myself, but it's not without reason. Here I have a pretty simple graph of data that I think pretty well visualizes why I feel this way. Now, the battery life I've been getting has seemed to completely depend on the type of programs I have running. For example, if I'm only using Office applications in Microsoft Edge, then battery life is drastically better than it is during normal use. And I was able to pick up this observation because sometimes I actually do only use Office applications and Microsoft Edge in a single day, nothing else, period. But I'd like to think that most people aren't going to be getting a Surface Pro 8 just for Office applications, so I don't think these are very good numbers to tune your expectations against since it's kind of unrealistic. Although the main reason why I'm still including these numbers is because at both 60Hz and 120Hz, screen on time is within a small margin of error from each other. They aren't significantly different. Using only Office applications and Microsoft Edge on the Surface Pro 8 consistently gets me approximately 9 hours and a half of battery battery life regardless of what refresh rate I have the display set to. We can start to see differences in battery life much more drastically once we start to introduce other programs into the mix, but if we take a look at the battery life while gaming, although these numbers are trash, they are also within a very narrow margin of error from each other. This observation during gaming is even more outstanding because this straight up never happens. Gaming is a lot more graphics intensive than most activities that regular people would be doing on a computer. So it's a surprise that the battery life while gaming at 120 Hertz isn't worse than the battery life while gaming at 60 Hertz. Other laptops with comparable specs don't do this. So there must be something special going on with the Surface Pro 8 specifically. Now, all of this may change once the battery starts degrading, whenever that happens, but as of this review, I am getting pretty close to having a full year with the Surface Pro 8 that I'm daily driving, and my battery life has been more or less unchanged. So the Surface Pro 8 should last you quite a while if you take care of it. Charging times are kind of long in my opinion, but I'll let you be the judge of that. With the included 65 watt charger, it takes two hours at most to charge from 8.8% to 100%. There are other Surface chargers with a higher wattage that do actually charge the Surface Pro 8 significantly faster, but for the purposes of setting hard expectations, charging the Surface Pro 8 using most first party Surface Connect solutions that are recommended for this device should never exceed two hours. If you'd like, you can charge the Surface Pro 8 through the USB-C ports as well, but not all USB-C charging cables are the same. Now the charger that's included in the box has a proprietary connector called Surface Connect, and I think I mentioned that name already. I get that proprietary connectors aren't the most favorable thing in the world, but Microsoft does it just fine. 
trust me, I've already made my point about the Surface Connect port being a good port. But for those who are new to my channel, the TLDR is that this connector is a lot more convenient than you think. Assuming your Surface Connect accessories are first party or otherwise follows Microsoft's standards, it's magnetic, capable of fast charging, and capable of data transfers as well. Think of it like Microsoft's version of MagSafe, but like significantly more capable. Honestly, if you're crying over this connector, then you've obviously never used it before. So give it a try, but be real about it too. I really can't stand people talking trash about this connector when they haven't even given it a fair chance. Okay, wow. We talked a lot about the Surface Pro 8 today, and with reason. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to the Surface Pro 8. Again, I do wish that the CPU, the port placements, and the Surface Pro signature keyboards were a bit different, but regardless, I feel like the Surface Pro 8 is still a good product for many to consider. With that said, I don't think we've ever been any closer to getting the perfect Microsoft Surface Pro. If you didn't like the Surface Pro before, there are a lot of great reasons to like it now. And if you were holding out on getting a new Surface Pro before, well, this might now pique a lot of your guys' interests. Maybe not when it comes to that price premium, but if you can afford it, then the unrivaled amount of versatility that the Surface Pro 8 offers should completely change the way you approach how you work, how you play, and how you go about life on your computer. For the better. Clearly, this is a product that some will still have a handful of mixed feelings about, but I think most of us can agree that this is the Surface Pro that everyone's been waiting for. This is the one that a lot of Surface fans and prosumer level tech enthusiasts, like myself, have been asking to see for years. Even if you decide that this isn't quite yet the device that you want to buy, it does get you pretty excited for what the next Surface Pro is going to have in store for us. We finally have a somewhat well-rounded balance of the focus on performance that the Surface Pro 7 Plus had, but with the design, the aesthetics, and the hardware improvements that the Surface Pro X introduced. It's almost as though the Surface Pro X walked so that the Surface Pro 8 could run. Microsoft Surfaces have started to become very interesting again, and it's because this, the Surface Pro 8, has given us a glimpse of the greatness that will be progressively arriving with Microsoft Surface. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again in my next video.